1 Corinthians 13, and we're going to be looking at verse 11 this morning. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Father, we come before you this morning, and we ask you to grow us in your understanding of the word. We ask you to grow us in your son. We ask, God, that as we turn our focus to you, God, you would meet us and that you would direct us. That, Lord, you would be in our time, um, Lord, and that you would uh, lead this study this morning as we look to know you deeper and we look to know you in a better way, in a closer, intimate way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, everybody can be seated. Paul speaking here says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. There is a time when it's okay to be a kid, to think as a child and do childish things. It's when we were children, <laughs> little. I've got three beautiful kids. I love each and every one of them. They're all unique in their own way. I've got a little intellect in AJ, my little chess player. I love that guy to death. Uh, my little sweetheart, Gwenny, she's seven. And she's just a snuggle bug. And then my little fireball, my little warrior, Asher, he's a little crazy man. And he's four years old. And when I talk to Asher, I don't expect him to carry a conversation with me like I would carry with Wyatt. When I carry a conversation with Asher, I'm like, hey, Asher, bud. And he's like, I'm not Asher. I'm Sonic. <laughs> Want to see me turn on my speedball? <laughs> and he just zooms all over the place. And so our conversation continues as, hey, Sonic, how are you doing? <laughs> He's a child. He's four years old. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There's a progression. As, as we grow, as we get older, we should become more mature. And that's all, not always the case. We get older, but we don't always mature. Maturity. This is something that each one of us, because it benefits us, we always want to see it in the other person. No one here is married. How many of you would like to see maturity in your spouse? <laughs> Something's going on, you're like, you're not, that wasn't very mature, right? We want to see maturity in our home. We want to see maturity in our family. We want to see maturity in our friends and relationships. If I'm sharing something with someone or someone's sharing with me, we want them to handle that conversation with maturity, right? We want to see maturity in those people around us because it benefits us. But what about us? How many times do we look in the mirror and say, is Daniel maturing? Am I mature? In my Christianity, have I matured or have I stayed in the same place I was as a babe when I first came to know the Lord? We are celebrating the Christmas season, and it's a time of year that we can see a lot of immaturity. Um, I remember a few years back, quite a while back, is before I was married, um, I loved, I was single and I loved to shop late night, so I would go and get in those crazy lines and wait for them to open the stores and, and open up the special prizes and packages that if we waited three hours, we could walk in and just grab one and go, right? We had to be there first. And I remember one year I was there, and there was a line of people, and there's a, and I don't have no idea how she did this because she was a small woman. She's about four or five people back. They open the doors, and it's like a John Hughes film, Chris Columbus. I mean, anyway, Christmas movie. Everyone just crashed in the doors and crashed in the building. And this woman picks up her child, and she chucks her child over us. I'm watching a child go over me as he lands on top of about a six-foot platform box. It's four foot by four foot, and he's sliding across the top. And I'm praying for him, Lord, let him have a good grip. And he holds on, and he pulls back on top. And then he just goes like a wild man, starts tearing and ripping and tearing and ripping, because apparently they had seen something that they wanted and they wanted to be the first one to grab one before they were gone. But this woman threw her child, chucked her child over us. <laughs> I 
a year or two later, I'm at a store and I'm walking in and there's one thing left on the wall and that's what I'm looking for. And as I'm walking up to get it, these two women pop out of nowhere and they kind of like bang off of each other like, like a ping pong ball or a pinball machine, right? And one woman grabs it and the other woman decks that woman right there in the store. I mean, it was a loud pop, drop the woman to the floor. She picks up the prize like she's just this champion. <laughs> the manager shows up, takes the toy, throws both of the ladies out, and I got the toy. <laughs> so, lesson in being patient and mature. No, I'm just kidding. Good, right time, I guess. But yeah, immaturity. Uh, we can get caught up on the commercial side of Christmas, of the holiday. We see a lot of self-focus. We can get busy with traditions, family traditions, family events, and none of those things in and of themselves are particularly a bad thing. But when they become what the season is about, when we get all wrapped up by these things and we lose sight of what we're celebrating, it's immaturity. We have to watch for that. We forget that this is the celebration of God acting upon his great love, his great love for his creation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We are celebrating that Jesus came down as a baby and set in motion his plan for salvation for us. And the greatest victory of all time, the greatest victory in history. The Bible, as we're going through it and we're looking at it, we see a lot of victories. We see a lot of battles, mighty battles that are won through the power of God coming upon men and women throughout Scripture. But this morning, I want to discuss how God's greatest victory, not just the battle won, but how Satan being defeated and the war being won should impact our lives. How as thinking adults, this truth should cause us to respond and mature in our relationship with Jesus. Look at our text again. When I was a child... I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The world, Satan, they want to keep us as children, sinking in spiritual adolescence, not moving from milk to meat, drowning in selfishness, focused on our needs in our own personal little bubbles even removing the importance of what we're about to celebrate this Christmas. All the while, Jesus came to earth to free us from self, death, and the wrath of an almighty God that we deserve, each and every one of us, to be able to be found mature in Him, empowered by the Spirit. And when we're empowered by the Spirit and maturity in our walk, we take care of the widow, the orphan, our neighbor, even our enemies. We care for them. The enemy wants us to stay like a child, but Paul says we ought not act like children anymore. Christmas Day, just around the corner. It's crazy because, like I said, it feels like this year was dragging so slow with all the stuff going on, and these last few weeks has just been a blur. But it's right around the corner. Now, I want to ask you, when do you guys start thinking about Christmas, and when do you start thinking about its meaning? In my household, we talk about Jesus every day. I'm blessed to have a wonderful teacher for my kids and my wife who loves teaching our children, um, and uh, I love talking about the Lord, and we talk about Jesus daily, and we talk about him as God, we talk about him as the creator, we talk about him as being Jesus the baby the Savior, and of course, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So when Christmas comes, 
we are celebrating something we've been discussing and looking forward to all year. It's something that they've been, they're expecting for, they're wanting to get to because they know it's a part of his plan of salvation for us. Without my wife and I as older believers uh, leading our children in this way as younger believers, this probably wouldn't even cross their mind until the world said, Christmas is coming. Until they're at Home Depot in August and they see the trees up. <laughs> in August, I'm just kidding. But they probably wouldn't even be thinking about it until the world says, Christmas is here. And a lot of children, it's like this. That's when they start thinking about Christmas, somewhere around October, the end of October. Then it starts to get really serious after Thanksgiving. For some, it changes how they act because they don't want to mess up their opportunity or their full potential to receive the presents that they are desiring. So they're mindful. Some people put an elf on the shelf. And for those that are just goofing around having fun, that's fine. But some people actually do this and say it's watching you to make their children behave. Instead of filling their home with the Spirit of God and the desire to please Him, they put an elf on the shelf. Or they look to legends, Santa Claus. He's always watching. He's making a list. Checking twice if you're naughty or nice, right? They put these things in motion so that their kids will respond better for a month or two. And that's because a lot of children can be motivated many times by what they desire. The things that they want that they think will change their life. You know, my little girl, she's got 9,000 little dolls. But if it was just that one more, mama, I wouldn't need another doll. <laughs> it's that special toy. Everything would be fine if we just had that game system. I would be happy the rest of the year. My world would be complete. But as parents, we know that a gift, a toy, a game, or whatever it is, it doesn't make a lasting effect on their behavior. Unless there's a change of heart, unless there's maturity in them, there is no lasting change. A gift from us, no matter how much love it's given them, can't remove sin in their heart. The complete work of Jesus isn't like this. The gift that he gives us is not like that. It has the power to completely change everything about who we are if we accept it. And if we do accept it, and he is working through us, we should be different. We should mature as men and women directed by God. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Guys, Jesus desires for us to grow up. He does not want us to be manipulated by our childish desires. Robbed of what he wants to do in our lives. Jesus wants us to be mature believers, and through maturity, he wants us to turn our lives over to him, to be filled with him, to fight for the things that he fights for, to love for the things that he loves, with an all-consuming, unselfing love. That's intense. But that's what he desires. So if that's the case, I have three questions I want us to think about this morning. One, as maturing believers, what are we called to do after we accept Jesus? Two, as maturing believers, what's the purpose in fighting a spiritual war that Jesus has already won? And three, as maturing believers, what stops us from doing what we know Jesus has called us to do? So let's, let's grab that first one. As maturing believers, what are we called to do after we accept Jesus? Believe 
and keep believing. This is actually one childlike attribute that we actually should keep is our faith in Jesus, the way we believe, the way we lean upon him, the way we trust him, the way we accept him, the way we desire to be a part of his kingdom. We should have that childlike faith. My little ones, I was talking about little Gwynny earlier. I love that little girl to death. She's a little sweetie. But there's, you know, she loves me so much, she knows I'm going to care for her. She knows I'm going to take care of her. She knows I'm going to protect her. When she's scared, she runs to me. When she really wants something, she runs to me. <laughs> she comes to me. And no matter how much she knows you guys or loves you guys, you would not be able to turn her heart against me right now. She has too much faith in me. Now, I'm human. And as a sinful man and as a sinful father, if she can love me that much and have that much trust in me, how much more should we not have trust and love for a perfect father? Because there is no mistake in Jesus. He doesn't accidentally do the wrong thing. He doesn't accidentally forget to pick something up he said he would pick up or take you somewhere he was going to take you. No. He doesn't buy you a dress that's too big or too small. Everything Jesus does is perfect. And he desires us to love him and believe in him and have that faith like a child. So although we mature as believers and we want to see maturity in our walk, our faith should always be that childlike, I love in you and protected by you and run to you. Second thing we do after we accept Jesus as we're maturing is we obey him. That's a novel thought. We obey him. First Samuel says, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. With this point, I think that a lot of times we can make mistakes as believers as confusing sophistication with maturity. We come to know the Lord, we give our life to the Lord, we're passionate for the Lord and we have that childlike fire and then we mature or excuse me, we, we kind of refine our walk with the Lord. But it's not maturity. We look to sacrifice or we look to give things or maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's money. Maybe it's money, maybe it's um, service. Maybe it's something else that we give because we're like, ah, oh, we've already done enough of this stuff when we were first on fire for the Lord. Now we will sacrifice these other things to the Lord. And in our sophistication, we think that we're giving something to God that he doesn't own. He owns everything. Everything is his. Now, if we sacrifice in any of those areas with the right heart, it's a beautiful thing and the Lord loves it. What he doesn't love is somebody saying, I don't want to obey. I don't want to do these things. And so I'm just going to placate God by giving money. Placate God by sending somebody to Bible college. Placate God by showering my kids and my wife and my family with gifts. That is a completely the wrong heart. God desires these things, our time, our money, these other things, is because he has given us everything. He owns everything. It's all his. And out of faith and obedience, we respond by making him first in our life with our time. We respond by giving him the first fruits of our labor. Not because he doesn't have it, because we are honoring him and trusting him and obeying him. But if we do those things because we're trying to buy off God, it doesn't bless him. It doesn't matter how big the sacrifice is. Jesus wants relationship and he wants obedience. Next, as maturing believers, uh, we are called to do after or what we're called to do after we accept Jesus is step out in faith. Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. These are a powerful couple of verses, and believers are pretty familiar with these verses. Even the world that may not be familiar with the Bible know these verses, or they've heard of them or something close to them. And we hear them in kids' songs. And so we kind of like, oh, that's a sweet little, mm -hmm, trust the Lord in all your heart. Right? Powerful, though. Powerful verses. 
if we trust in the Lord and if we step out in faith, it will cause us to do something. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths, which means we're moving. The word tells us, he doesn't just say, trust in me and I hope you make it. Start here. Hopefully you're on the other end when I'm there. He clears our path. He lights our path. He directs our path. But we need to step out in faith. And lastly here, as maturing believers, what are we called to do after we accept Jesus? We share the gospel. Guys, I know we talk about all of these a lot, but this is not a request. Sharing the the gospel is a command. It's what he calls us to do. He said to them, Jesus speaking, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. As those that are maturing in the Lord, it is a command for us to share the gospel with those around us. But why don't we share the gospel? I think it's tied into these other things. Because there's something with the way we, wrong with the way we believe. We're not obeying, and we're not stepping out in faith. Because if we believe God, if we believe the work that he's done in our life has saved us from hell, if we believe that he has washed us clean, if we believe that he has cleansed us of all of our sin, if we believe that the punishment that was due to me and due to everyone in this room has been washed and paid for and wiped away by God, how in the world are we not sharing it with those around us? How in the world can we work next to somebody and not speak to them words of life? An opportunity to come and know a Savior that will snatch them from hell for eternity. We need to mature. We need to believe. We need to obey. We need to step out in faith. And we need to share the gospel what we are called to do. Point two, as maturing believers, what's the purpose in fighting a spiritual war that Jesus has already won? You ever thought about that? Has that crossed your mind? Like, what's the big deal? Jesus already won the battle. I'm going to do a couple things, pop up here and there, get a couple brownie points, die and be in heaven. It's all good. Jesus did the work. He did. And the battle is won. But the reason we fight this spiritual war is for what we just talked about, the unsaved. The unsaved souls on this planet. Luke says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The purpose of Jesus coming, the the reason we're celebrating Christmas is it's coming down as a baby, set in motion his plan of salvation for us, dying for us, growing up and dying for us as a Savior, raised from the dead on the third day to free us of our sin. The reason he did it is for the lost, for me, for you, before we knew the Lord, and for the person we can't stand at work, for the person that we can't stand in office, for the person we can't stand in our HOA. (laughs) It's got a little binocular. It's always checking on everybody. (laughs) For the lost. Although Jesus' work is complete, it is. And he has paid the payment due for every sin ever committed, every sin that we are committing now or have this week or will today, and every sin that ever will be completed or committed, his work is so complete, so magnificent, it's paid for all of it. But there are millions and millions of people who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There are millions of people that are still dead in their sin. There are millions of people who are walking in darkness. And we don't know how many times they have to hear the gospel before they respond. How many times did you? I know that the the Lord moved on my heart many times before I surrendered completely. 
And when I say completely, obviously, there's still more surrendering. We're just surrendering every day. But before I gave my life to him and I could say, yes, I know now I am saved. Many times, many times the Lord called me. And we are many times the voice, his voice, God's voice, Jesus' voice to the world around us. And the Lord uses us. We fight a battle for them, for the unsaved. We fight the spiritual battle even though the war has been won because our flesh needs to die for ourself. Paul in uh, Colossians says, but now you yourselves are to put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The flesh is there. These things that we read about, enemy can stir it up. He can mix the pot just right and make the flesh want to pop out in these areas. And it happens daily. This isn't Salvation is a one-time thing. If you've given your life to the Lord and you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved and secure. But the old man, putting him to death, that's daily. Daily. Every day. And if you think, well, I'm having a good week and I'm just going to slide by for a while because I've had a good week, you are backsliding. That's the sliding you're doing. Because it's a daily thing God has called us to do. It's a spiritual war that daily we need to fight. Jesus has called us to do it. That's the other reason. For the weapons of warfare are not carnal. This is in 2 Corinthians. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. A mature believer goes to war, puts on the full armor of God, and goes to war. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. God outfits us for this spiritual battle. To fight for others, to fight the flesh daily in ourself, and listen to what it says. It doesn't say he gives us this so we can put it on and just kind of walk by stuff and we're protected and hope that it goes away. <laughs> listen to what he says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, for casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Are we doing that? God is equipping us for a spiritual battle to fight for our lost brothers and sisters, for ourselves and the, the, the old man that tries to creep up, the sinful nature that tries to come back, so that we're able to tear down strongholds, to cast down those things that would raise themselves up against God. So many times, we just walk by. A mature believer does what we're called to do, and we fight for the things that God fights for. Three, as maturing believers, what stops us from doing 
what we know Jesus wants us to do. A lot of these things we've talked about many times. Some of the top ones I threw on here. Fear. Fear in any capacity, any subject, any topic. Fear stops us from doing what Jesus has called us to do. But that is not from God. 2 Timothy says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So if God hasn't given it, who's given it? Satan, the enemy. And when we play into fear, when we allow it to move us and manipulate us and control us, we are literally saying, we don't want your gift, Jesus. We want the fear. We're going to substitute what you have for me for a lie from the enemy. Because it says, for God has not given the spirit of fear. So Satan's giving it. What does God give? The spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Guys, he's not just saying, don't fear. It's like my, my, my little guy, my little Asher, little warrior. If he sees something that's scary on TV, I go, oh, don't be afraid. That doesn't help him. God doesn't do that. He doesn't say, don't be afraid, Carrie. Let's catch you on the, on the flip side. Don't be afraid, Andreas. I'll see you later. He says, don't be afraid because I will give you power and love and a sound mind. And we forfeit that when we yield to fear. Another is laziness. (laughs) What stops us as mature believers or maturing believers from doing what Jesus calls us to do? Is laziness. He who gathers in the summer is a wise son, the Proverbs say. But he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. I don't want to cause the name of Jesus shame. I don't want to make the Lord have to do a work for somebody else to remove the stain that I put in their eyes because of my laziness. I don't want to see a crop a field ready to be harvested and say, ah, Wyatt's got it. PJ's got it. I'm going to let them do it. We're going to end up, like I've said before, we're going to end up like characters in Wally. We show up to church on Wednesday. We show up to church on Sunday. We've got great teaching from Pastor Joe, other pastors when Zach was teaching on Wednesday night. And then we go home, and then we come back on a monthly Bible study, which is all wonderful and great. God desires us to grow in his word. God desires us to gather in fellowship. But if that's all we do, we're getting fat on the word, and we're going to be like those characters, and we're going to be 900 pounds, and we're going to lose our bone density, and we're going to float around on a machine, not able to walk. (laughs) That's not what God has planned for us. He says, go, bring in the harvest. Go do the work I've called you to do. I will empower you to do the work I've called you to do. I will give you strength to do the work I've called you to do. I will give you the ability to do the work I've called you to do. I will give you the ability to overcome great difficulty with what I call you to do if you will listen and not be lazy. The next one is a lack of faith. What causes a maturing believer from doing what Jesus has called him to do is a lack of faith. The writer of Hebrews says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Guys, if there's an area in our life where we're not stepping out in faith, If there's an area in life where we're allowing ourselves to live with a lack of faith, we are not pleasing God. It's not like it's not a big deal because I know I please Him here and I know I please Him. We are not pleasing God. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And He makes it so easy 
for us to please him if we bend and if we obey. James says, but let him ask in faith if we ask the Lord for something with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Waves, they're beautiful. They're fun to watch when they're slapping each other and kind of bouncing around. But they can be dangerous. Um, I was out on the water a few years back. Weather started to get kind of bad and the water got kind of choppy. And I'm not like an experienced what are you, boatman. I don't know. What you, I don't even know what to call it. It's, it's a lake. It's not a seaman. <laughs> so whatever it is. But I know it's time to get in. So I come in. 20, 30 other expensive boats come in. And these guys are out there a lot. They got a lot of money invested and they're docking their boats. But five or six guys stay out there. And all of them, I quit counting at five because I had to leave. All of those five guys got tipped. And they're just floating in the lake waiting for someone to rescue them. Right? If we're like that, if we say, you know what, the waters are crazy, but I'm just going to chart it. I'm just going to go out in it without faith. It's going to throw us. Peter, he did something that none of us have ever done, and the only other person to do it was Jesus Christ, and he walked on water. He defied the laws of nature, but he saw the waves, saw the storm, got nervous, and he sunk. Praise God. And when he sunk, he cried out, and Jesus grabbed him. And that's the same for us as believers. But do you want to live a life getting tossed and crying, save me, save me, save me? Or do you want to stop being tossed? Do you want to stop being thrown by the world? Lack of faith will cause you to be tossed. So when we look at these things, laziness, fear, lack of faith, and probably 25 others that if we spent time we could talk about, it all comes back to immaturity. We are immature if we find ourselves in these areas. God wants to mature us. The writers, Hebrews in chapter 5 says, For by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If we're in this room, we've walked with the Lord for any considerable amount of time. The writer's saying we should be able to share. We should be able to teach. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone here is called to be a pastor. It doesn't mean everyone's called to be that type of a, a teacher. But you should be able to share more about your relationship and about the Word of God than you did when you first came to know the Lord. But so many of us don't. We're still drinking milk. We're not understanding the deeper truths of the Word. We're not sharing and growing and maturing in the way we share what the God has done in our life. If I'm having a conversation with Mike over here, Man to man, he's a little, a little wiser than I am. Walk with the Lord a few more years. And I walk up to him and I say, hey, Mike, and start talking to him. He goes, I'm not Mike, I'm Sonic. Like my little Asher did. I talked about in the beginning. And he starts rolling around in the ball. That's going to be a little weird. <laughs> he might do that, Janine says. <laughs> But that would be strange. Man, I pray to God that if somebody who's lost, somebody who's young in their faith, somebody who has questions about the Lord, they come up and talk to us and say, put your name in here and start asking questions. And you're like, no, I'm Sonic. And you start rolling around. I pray that's not the case. I pray that we have matured. I pray that we have grown up. I pray that we have walked with the Lord in a way in which it shows. 
as believers in Jesus Christ, bought by His blood, filled with the Holy Spirit, given His word in every conceivable translation, every conceivable language, we should not be babes or immature Christians. It's time for us to put away childish things. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. And when I became a man, I put away childish things. From the beginning of time, from Adam to every believer in this room and every believer that's watching online, we have seen Jesus' relationship with mankind. We see his desire for us to be saved, his desire to have us have victory in our lives, to see us mature in our relationship with him, the one true king. Let's do it. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you did not leave us as orphans when you called us and or bought us. But Lord, you left us your Holy Spirit. Lord, you indwell us with your Holy Spirit. God, you teach us through your Holy Spirit. You teach us through your word. Help us to be men and women who look to know and understand your ways. Help us to look to you, Father. Help us to be obedient to you, to bow our hearts to you, Lord. Help us to remove pride from our life. Help us to remove arrogance from our life. Help us to humble ourselves before you, that you might move in our lives, that you might grow us up in your Son. Jesus, we desire to be mature, we desire to be able to share with understanding what you've done in our life and what your word says you want to do in others and what you want to continue to do in our life as we grow more and more um, in love with you, closer to you, deeper relationship with you. It doesn't matter, Lord, if we gave our life to you today or we've walked with you a hundred years. There's always areas in which we can grow and we can mature. Help us to continue to move forward. Strengthen us by your spirit. Wash us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Hope you have a wonderful week.